In World War I, trench warfare descended into a stalemate, one of the deadliest battlefield situations in human history. As battle lines were drawn and troops became firmly entrenched, but unable to push forward, a situation formed where neither side was able to make any meaningful gains, but remained exposed to the dangers of the battlefield all the same. This stalemate was the result of a simple reality. The trench lines for either side were firmly embedded across the entire battlefield, with no flanks or weak spots that could be exploited, forcing wave after wave of artillery barrages and frontal assaults as the only feasible combat options. This battlefield situation was devastating. With no real strategic breakthroughs possible, the conflict became a war of attrition, or a war where the primary goal was to simply outlast your opponent by forcing them to run out of soldiers and ammunition before you did. Ultimately, nearly 10 million soldiers and an additional 10 million citizens died as both sides faced disease, artillery shells, over-the-top raids, poison, and more, all to move their map just a few feet if they were lucky. But national leaders remained stubbornly unwilling to relent, forcing millions of soldiers to die before finally giving in, just to maintain the status quo and save face for politicians. It's a situation that nobody wants a repeat of, the most wasteful form of war, where everybody pays and nobody wins. But according to some, a repeat is currently exactly where the world is heading. As the war in Ukraine continues to unfold, it is becoming increasingly common for the media to apply the logic of a World War I stalemate to the Ukrainian front, leading many to fear a long war with no end in sight, with some suggesting a Ukrainian surrender is inevitable and shouldn't be put off any longer. On the surface, it may seem to be quite logical, with battle lines that have barely moved in over a year. But in reality, there is a lot more to this war than meets the eye, or the front page headlines. Today's analysis was made possible by MyHeritage, the sponsor of this video and the leading global service for family history research and DNA testing. If you're like me, you're probably at least a little bit curious about who your ancestors were and what impact they may have made on the world, or even simply what they might have looked like in real life. My Heritage is my own personal favorite tool when it comes to building and exploring my family tree, and I've used it to discover fascinating things, like new relatives and even draft documents that showed my family fought on opposite sides during World War I. As long as you know the names of your parents and grandparents, my heritage makes it fun and easy to discover your origins and build out your family tree. As you build, their system does all the hard work, making it easy to search and discover information and connections from 19 billion plus historical documents, and providing features like instant discoveries that allow you to add an entire branch to your family tree with just the click of a button. I even had some fun with the platform animating an old photo of one of my famous ancestors to see what he might look like in real life. Still, not quite as good looking as me. If you want to make discoveries like this on your own, what are you waiting for? Sign up right now using the link in the description or in the pinned comment for a special 50% discount. Thanks to MyHeritage for sponsoring this video. Now, let's head back to the Ukrainian front. For a war to be considered a true stalemate, at least two major things are required. First, there must truly be stagnant battlefield conditions. The objectives of both sides must be prevented from moving forward due to strategic realities that prevent a breakthrough, such as the World War I trenches running from coast to mountains, with no soft flanks available to exploit. Second, there must be no way to change or sidestep those strategic realities. For a true stalemate to form, both sides must already have everything at their disposal in play, with no way to acquire more things to put in play, and still be unable to achieve a breakthrough. Both criteria are very important to a true stalemate. Seeing either criteria individually is extremely rare. Seeing both criteria appear together, especially in the day of modern warfare, is almost impossible. If the objectives of either side are moving forward, even if much more slowly than expected or desired, the war is not a stalemate. It's simply moving more slowly than expected or desired. And if the strategic realities of today can somehow be changed, even if only by the use of extremely desperate measures, the war is not a stalemate. It simply hasn't yet progressed to the point where either side is willing to use those desperate measures. A game of chess ends in a stalemate when both sides have no remaining legal moves to make without sacrificing their own king. 
This stalemate can be enforced only because in a game of chess, everyone is required to play by the same rules, and no new pieces can be added to the game to shake things up. But real warfare is different. It's not a game. There is no tightly controlled and enforced rulebook that prevents players from making surprising moves. And there is nothing preventing players from adding more pieces to the board at any given moment to end a stalemate. In real warfare, there is only what you are willing and able to do, and what you are not. So let's consider the war in Ukraine. For the past year, there have been few meaningful moves on either the Russian or the Ukrainian front lines, with only a little over 500 square miles of territory changing hands, despite tens of thousands of casualties and billions of dollars invested in equipment and resources. Russian generals have made several attempts to push further into Ukraine, only to be met by staggering loss rates and little to show to their Kremlin handlers. And for their part, Ukraine has also attempted to push Russia out of its territory, although with more conservative use of forces, only to be held back by thick minefields and fortifications that have hampered their efforts and caused them to slow down their assaults rather than wasting too many of their men. Reflecting on these trends, Ukraine's commander-in-chief recently released an essay on the war where he appeared to, and I do mean appeared to, describe the current situation as a stalemate, saying that without further technology, it would not be possible for his forces to push Russia out. And Russia, for its part, has picked up on this narrative and has tried to double down to achieve its own ends, acting through their intermediary, Belarus, to say that the situation is wasteful and requires a stop to hostilities, something which I've covered in another video, and which reveals that Russia believes they have something to gain by painting the situation as more hopeless than it is. But the truth is, there is much more to this situation than meets the eye, and a second glance reveals that things aren't quite as doom and gloom as some headlines might lead people to believe. While the front lines may not have moved much in the past year, it is indeed a fact that Russia has retreated and withdrawn forces from many key areas, unable to sustain the barrage of Ukrainian assaults. This trend is making certain key regions untenable for Russia to defend long term, and also means that, by definition, the war itself is not a stalemate, even if certain fronts appear to be frozen, because the war as a whole has not been stopped from progressing. And it's also a fact that the Ukrainian general's famous stalemate essay which many have claimed as a Ukrainian admission that they cannot achieve victory, does not actually say what most headlines about it claim it says. And when one reads just a little bit deeper, and reads the actual essay instead of the headlines about the essay, in context with other statements that have come from the Ukrainian government, a different story readily emerges. Not of an admission to an unbreakable stalemate, but of a simple request for the key tools that can help to ensure a quick victory without the wasteful use of people's valuable lives. First, let's talk about why the narrative has become so confusing. Because there is a broader geopolitical context behind what's recently been going on here, and a narrative supported in part by Russia, as they make a valiant effort to try to defeat one of their main enemies, holding them back from victory. Influxes of Western weapons into Ukraine. As the Middle East becomes the new sexy thing for Western politicians and news outlets to focus on in an upcoming election season, political support for Ukraine has begun to dry up, and there is increasing pressure to bring the conflict to a close. Not to victory, mind you, but simply to a close. After nearly two years, the war in Ukraine has begun to feel dull, boring, and even frustrating to many Western voters, many of whom have moved past their initial shock at seeing civilians bombed by Russian invaders, and have begun to simply accept Russian aggression as a fact of life, or even allowed themselves to be swayed by Russian talking points, while the shock of what they have seen going on in the Middle East remains fresh in their minds. With tensions growing, many people in the West are nervous that if a war in Ukraine does not end soon, they may find themselves potentially supporting a prolonged, broader war being fought on two fronts. Or potentially even three fronts if China makes a move against Taiwan. And this nervousness is creating a confirmation bias and a filter on reality that colors the way many Westerners view and report on the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Because many of Ukraine's Western partners are becoming weary of supporting the ongoing conflict, promoting the idea that the war has become a stalemate is a natural way of settling the consciences of Western voters and politicians by telling them that even if they did continue to support Ukraine, it wouldn't make a difference, allowing them to redirect their attention elsewhere without feeling guilty for giving up on their partner. 
Russian media knows this, and has supported this exact narrative, even going a step further in seeding the idea that continued Western support is not getting Ukraine closer to a victory, but is instead only prolonging the inevitable and costing more Ukrainian lives. By helping them, Russia claims, the West is actually hurting them. It's a clever psychological trick that flips someone's positive intentions and frames them as the very thing causing the suffering they are trying to prevent, leaving them in a state of confusion and inaction. And it's a classic example of potential KGB misdirection, with many well-cited parallels throughout the Cold War. Many well-meaning Western media outlets in turn have cited similar talking points, not realizing what their original source was. You would think that most people could see right through this. But for some reason, many Westerners have chosen to believe this talking point that comes from Russia, rather than simply listening to what Ukraine itself is actually saying about its will to continue fighting. Spoiler alert! Ukrainians themselves have not lost their will to fight. And over and against the talking points, they do not feel like they are being used as Western pawns in a stalemate. Recent surveys show that the majority of Ukrainians still support fighting until the war is won, and until Russia leaves all of their occupied lands. That's because they see the actual enemy army in their own backyards, and not just in news clippings. And the enemy for them is real, and not theoretical. They want freedom for their country, and are glad to have Western support to help them in that fight. They do not see Western support as costing Ukrainian lives, but rather as protecting and preserving them from allowing Russian aggression to go any further. What Russia wants more than anything is a weakened target that they can simply bulldoze over. And currently, the best way for them to do this is by spreading a false stalemate narrative that weakens support from Ukraine's critical partners. The Russian army may have lost most of its battlefield effectiveness, but Russian intelligence and state media services have lost none of their shrewdness. But one does need to ask how afraid Russia must truly be to be pushing talking points like this so hard. And to understand that desperation, and why the war is not actually a stalemate, you need look no further than the main naval port for Russia's Black Sea Fleet. Or rather, what used to be the main naval port for Russia's Black Sea Fleet which has now been rendered obsolete by long-range Ukrainian missiles, which have forced Russia to relocate much of its navy, and which proves that, when given access to the appropriate technologies, Ukraine can indeed quickly break through supposed stalemate situations. In a similar scenario, Ukrainian scalp and storm missiles recently broke through in the highest priority region for Russian air defense systems, hitting a shipyard next to the Kursk Strait Bridge, one of the only entry points into Crimea, and proving that, if they wanted to, Ukraine could penetrate many high-priority and heavily defended Russian targets closer to home. In fact, Ukraine has managed to hit Moscow with long-range drones, and has also destroyed many critical oil depots and airfields, whittling down on already fractured Russian supply chains. These are just small examples, and many more could be cited, showing that Ukraine is making progress, and in particular, is making Crimea untenable for Russia to defend long-term. This would become almost a certainty if Ukraine was given access to missiles with a 300-kilometer range, missiles which could be provided by many of Ukraine's Western partners, and which would give Ukraine the ability to target the remaining Russian naval targets and airfields on the peninsula. For these reasons, Crimea has become a primary strategic target for Ukraine, a target they could very well win, leading to a cascading victory for other objectives as well. In fact, Russia is so nervous about Ukraine's growing capabilities here that they are even discussing partnering with China to build an underwater tunnel to Crimea as a band-aid response so that they can continue to send supplies to the area when the inevitable happens and above-ground supply lines grind to a halt. Instead of recognizing reality, they are quite literally attempting to bury their heads in the sand. But that's a topic for another video, so be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell for a detailed breakdown in the future. Every time Russia takes a big hit to the nose like this, stalemate narratives introduce themselves once again, often starting with Russia and their partners, like Belarus, and then trickling down into Western media outlets, through journalists that find it easier to repeat softened down Russian talking points than it is to do actual critical thinking, sacrificing Ukrainian lives so that they can exist for a few more days in their mediocre career, whether intentional or not. And there's a good reason for Russia to promote things like this. 
Successes like these make Russia very nervous that if Ukraine were to receive access to more advanced weaponry, Ukraine could easily make all of their territory untenable for Russian troops, and eventually allow Ukraine to completely win the war. Russia does not want this, so in an attempt to prove that Ukraine isn't making progress, and thereby exhaust the political will of Ukraine's partners, the stalemate narrative is introduced and repeated. This narrative usually ignores the progress Ukraine is making around Crimea, and focuses instead on the largely frozen front lines, as if that was the only arena in a very large war effort. And stalemate claims also ignore a major but very crucial fact about those frozen front lines that makes them not quite the freeze that most clickbait media headlines claim they are. Ukraine and Russia have very different ethos when it comes to the treatment of their troops, and very different appetites when it comes to throwing men at an objective. A phenomenon that means that while Russia has brought its full force to bear against Ukraine, the same is not yet true for Ukraine's efforts against Russia. And remember, for a stalemate to be a true stalemate, both sides must be maxed out, with no ability to notch up the pressure. Russia has proven throughout the war that they see many of their soldiers as basically nothing but meat shields, with many of them being drafted or recruited into the military after being deemed as undesirables. For example, in previous videos, we've shown how many Russian soldiers are prisoners, and the Russian elite can write off the loss of such troops as a net gain on their balance sheets of people the state no longer needs to pay to keep incarcerated. In another video, we've also shown how many Russian soldiers are minorities, disproportionately being drafted from regions that have historically been the most likely to foment separatist movements against Moscow. And their loss, too, can be barbarically written off by the Russian elite as a net gain towards their overall goals, by softening the strength of any potential internal opposition. These facts, and others, have made Russia willing to sacrifice hundreds of thousands of troops to capture relatively small objectives so that they can move the map forward and show progress. This has allowed Russia to claim several so-called victories, such as Bakhmut, albeit at a Pyrrhic cost, much higher than the strategic value of the objective. But Ukraine, for its part, places a much higher value on its men's lives, leading them to adopt a strategy that is intentionally slower and much more cautious to keep their casualties at a minimum. To put it another way, preservation of life is, in and of itself, a strategic priority for Ukraine, but not for Russia. Ukraine wants its territory back, but it wants it back for a reason to end the suffering of its people. And creating needless suffering to get that territory back is counterproductive to those goals. So when Ukraine encounters barriers during their counteroffensives, say, Russian air superiority that would devastate their men if they moved forward, they are not shy about holding back, backing off, and waiting for a better time. Because they value their men's lives more than their leader's temporary pride. Whereas Russia would push on no matter what the cost, securing small, strategic, but Pyrrhic steps forward to save face for its leaders, Ukraine has been unwilling to do the same. So Ukraine has not gained much territory since the early days of the war. But, critically ignored by many, it has also lost very little. For Westerners not on the firing line, this has sometimes led to misinterpretations of the situation on the ground, and impatience, leading them to believe that Ukraine is not making progress and leading many politicians to make demands for results that are unrealistic, with threats to remove their support if they don't. It's like the classic out-of-touch boss, saying that the beatings will resume until morale improves. In this case, though, the statement is instead, our support will continue to be withheld until you achieve the results that would only be possible with our support. A similar sentiment has been expressed by many media outlets which treat the war more like a show than an actual conflict involving real people's lives, acting like a picky audience saying they'll leave for other options if they don't see the character development they want within the next season. And in interviews with the Ukrainian president and Ukrainian generals, you can often see the exasperation in their faces at the unrealistic expectations of media outlets and politicians that implicitly demand that they force their troops forward to be just like Russia achieving Pyrrhic objectives just to satisfy the onlooking world. The irony is that one of the things that makes Ukraine worthy of our support is that they don't do this. But because they don't do this, the world is also losing its patience for continued support, demanding instead immediate results. The world writes the conflict off as a stalemate, 
when in reality, the generals are just trying to make the best decisions possible, and they value their soldiers' lives more than our opinions, and the victory of the war more than the victory of the battle. If this seems discouraging, this is hardly the first time in history that we've seen something like this. During D-Day, the invasion that led to the end of World War II in dramatic victory for the Allies, the people of the day didn't yet know what the outcome would be. Newspapers from media outlets safe overseas complained, saying that things were going slowly, with doomsday headlines predicting a very bad outcome. The media has always been impatient for results, and for quick dopamine hits. But D-Day proves that failing to live up to media expectations hardly means that you are losing the war. Going back to the famous essay of the Ukrainian commander-in-chief, we're now positioned to view these stalemate statements in context. Ukraine is not saying, and has never said, that the war as a whole is a stalemate. What they have said is that certain areas are showing slow progress due to a lack of fervor from their partners, who have failed to provide, or have been slow to provide, the key technologies needed for a total breakthrough. In some situations, temporary technological parity has caused Ukraine to be stuck in place, although it could push forward if it were willing to sacrifice more troops. But this in and of itself is impressive, considering Ukraine is a small nation, fighting what was once deemed to be the second most powerful military in the world. Imagine what could happen if the technology tipped in their favor. Ukraine has demonstrated that when they have access to the right tools, they can break through any door that is put in front of them. Thus far, those tools have not been given to them, so they have slowed down their counteroffensive efforts until they can level the playing field, rather than sending their troops into a situation where the enemy has air superiority. Until then, Ukraine continues to take steps forward. Slow steps, perhaps, but steps nonetheless. And in a war of attrition, Ukraine has a long way to go until they are truly depleted. They have time, and they are willing to take as much time as is needed. The question is, are their partners in it? For the long haul? Or will they treat the Ukraine war as just another show? Exciting yesterday, but quickly going out of season. If you're curious about what's holding Western partners back from committing to provide the support Ukraine needs, the main reason is fear of nuclear escalation. These fears may seem valid on the surface, but they are largely misplaced. Another fear tactic used by Russian media to achieve their own aims. For more on that, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell for our upcoming episode on why Putin could never launch a nuke. As the war in Ukraine continues, it's my goal to continue to provide you with the best information. For future updates, be sure to subscribe. And if you found something valuable in this video, please take a quick second to hit the like button so that more people can see this report. For more, click on one of these videos.